Hi everybody, I'm Zillow Litz and welcome. Today we're going to take a sneak peek look at Blood and Fury, the second volume in the World at War 85 series, designed by Keith Tracton and published by Lock and Load Publishing. This series is platoon level combat in Europe, 1985, the Cold War gone hot hypothetical World War III. We've got Soviets, US forces, Czech forces, East German, West German forces all tossed into the mix. This module adds a campaign map as well as the solo mode and Commonwealth forces. Now it is packed with stuff and very heavy. Let's jump in and get started and take a look at what's inside. I'm super excited to dig in and to show you this one. It is a four inch box just packed with stuff. Now, as I'm making this now in early June, there are still late pledges available for the game. It's going, just to give it status update, I think it's going into production or is in production now. So um, it's still available to add as a late pledge, but it isn't currently shipping. So with that in mind, this is a look at a prototype and keep that in mind as well, because some of the things might change slightly between what we see here today and the final version. I, I wouldn't expect very many changes, but there might be a few subtle changes. Now, I do want to take a step back moment too before we dig into Blood and Fury World at War 85 because if you're not familiar with this um, system, it's, it's really becoming more of a system than a game. This is volume two in the World at War 85 series. The volume one, which we've taken a look at on the channel with the first look video is Storming the Gap. Uh, this is another massive package and all of these things are interchangeable. So the maps from this, for the most part, are going to be interchangeable here. The rules are interchangeable in all the counters and with the design your own scenario system, Systems, it's really again become becoming a system more than an individual game. So there's this. Also, in addition to the Storming the Gap game, there are the expansions for Storming the Gap, Defense of Frankfurt, Storm and Steel, and then the Drive on the Gießen. And so these as well all blend together. So you know you kind of get the idea here as to uh, you know that this has gone beyond a simple uh, World at War 85 hypothetical World War III game to a game system. And indeed, this one, as I looked at Game Found this morning. It had over 900 backers and it was funded in about 15 minutes. And judging from the comments on the earlier World at War 85 videos, this is an incredibly popular system. So we also want to mention too, there is an, an additional expansion available for this Operation Red Gauntlet. We'll be taking a look at this uh, shortly in an upcoming video, but that's a different story than for today. With all that being said, let's jump in and concentrate now on Blood and Fury and take a look at what's inside. And again, four inches and it is packed from bottom to top with stuff. So this is just filled with stuff. Let's take a look at our metrics on the back. Complexity is a five. Um, I've read through the rules. I feel like a six out of 10 is a little bit more legitimate. Five, I feel like understates things. Not, not necessarily because um, of overall complexity. There's just a good bit of systems in modern combat. I will say that the rules are, uh, I, I think, excellent and they've evolved now to version 2.2. So cleared up any confusion or you know kind of ambiguities that would have been evident in volume one. So this is a good time, I think, to jump into, jump into this series because it's an evolved system of rules um, past what it was when it was originally published. Um, having said that, I wouldn't let the complexity scare you away, but I feel like a six is probably a more accurate estimate. Um, Unlike the original Storming the Gap and the expansions, the solo system is included in this volume, hence the solo ra suitability rating 9 out of 10. And I feel like that's very fair. I might even go a little bit higher. I, oh, there are cases where it does say the solo system, you might have to make some decisions for it. But there is a full solo system in the package, as we shall take a look at. With that being said, a couple of other parameters. We mentioned this is platoon level combat set in a hypothetical Cold War gone hot. We've got all sorts of combatants, and this module adds the Commonwealth forces to the mix. So let's jump in now and take a look at what's inside. So let's start exploring. First up, we have a couple of bookmarks here. One, a Blood and Fury bookmark, always a nice touch, and then a very cool mental health reminder, um, which is always nice to see. So two bookmarks in there, a nice little touch. And we have uh, two documentation booklets here. The first is uh, the companion book that we'll look at momentarily. And then we have Rule Set 2.2. This is a rather extensive volume. It's got uh, about 150 pages altogether. The back 20 pages or so are this uh, starter kit scenario, which gives you, and I believe you can play this with the existing maps where you maybe you need the maps from Storming the Gap. This is map number two here, which I know isn't in this set, but it is there. And then the, la the next 20 pages, so starting from the back, are the glossary, which is extremely helpful in terms of reading through the rules and stuff like that and being able to find stuff later on. And then we have a, a few more uh, kind of uh, random pieces of information, some designer notes and things like that, and then one more glossary of terms, which means that our 150-page manual condenses down to about 
a hundred pages. And you might be thinking, that's still a lot of rules. And yes, it is. Modern combat tend to has a lot, have a lot going on. But as I've mentioned before in a lot of the lock and load publishing manuals, this a hundred page manual I feel could be condensed almost down to 50 at, at some other game company sizes for a number of reasons. We have um, very large text, so it's easy on the eyes. We have two columns and there is just a ton of graphics, information, examples, and things like that. Um, I know that uh, in kind of discussing the rule, the rule set 2.2 with regards to storming the gap, I know the rules have gone, uh, gotten some extensive revisions and corrections and modifications and uh, clearing up ambiguities and refinements to them. And I felt like when I was reading rule set 2.2 and 2.0 that this is one of the best rule sets I've written, uh, read in a war game. I feel like this is uh, very, very clear, really easy to understand. And one of my signals is often when I have a question for a rule, um, the, the next paragraph will answer that question, you know, as I'm reading through things. Um, I've made way, way, way through all the rules right now. I really liked it. It was actually, uh, I mean, I like learning games, but this was really a joy to read. So uh, again, lots of different uh, explanations. I like the sequence. I like the exampling. I like the way they refer to rules that aren't there going forward. I felt like this made it a very easy learning process. So uh, all things good. Big thumbs up so far in the rule set. Having said that, it's time now to dig in and play the game, and that's where the real test is going to be. And there are still some complexities here. I mean, there's a lot going on with a lot of different mechanics, and a lot of units have special features, special conditions, special types of armor, and things like that, that is going to make uh, learning the rules and playing the game and executing the game take time to get down uh, accurately. But again, uh, for a big system, and one of the benefits here is that, you know, this rule set covers Blood and Fury, covers Storming the Gap, covers the expansion for that, and then the Operation Red Gauntlet, Red Gauntlet uh, expansion with this game too. So you're learning one big rule set, but now you can play a number of games because they cover uh, a number of games and cover a number of modules in the set here. Now, if you thought the rule book was big, we come to the companion book. Check it out. This is uh, almost 300 pages. This is a hefty set of rules. Now, the back end here, these are the virtual player aids. So these are duplicates of the player aid cards and are for customers who bought the game companion as a standalone play to using Vassal or Tabletop Simulator. So some people play on Vassal and will buy this to kind of do that, the rules in this to be able to do that. So that's why the player aids are kind of uh, manifested here. And then a lot of information. This mainly consists of uh, the scenarios in the game. But let's actually start from the front of this one. Uh, and we've got lots of, here we the national unit tables, which were standalone player aids in other versions of the game. They're all here. And so this is a lot of reference information and things like that that goes back and eats up about 50 pages, the player aids in the back and stuff like that. Pretty much anything that could be in written form has been added to this companion book here. Uh, unit descriptions and things like that. But let's, uh, then we get here, so at 2.30 or so is where the, um, the scenarios end here. But let's go in now and start from the beginning and just kind of walk through what's in here. There are some uh, module rules, so there are some expansion, expansions to the rules. Uh, pontoon units get added to this one and then a few other minor changes. But the biggest one that seems to me um, is pontoon units. I know there are tunnels as well in either this version or that Operation Red Gauntlet expansion. Uh, ferrying is include alternative armor piercing value, high rate of fire, high explosives, um, advanced night, night fighting capability. So some of these I've seen before in other places, but this is kind of the, the, uh, the rules that have been brought into this module as well. Then we get some uh, explanations of how to set up a scenario and the other things that are in here, though, there are a number of bigger sections, and I want to make sure I find those here. So we get past the how to set up a scenario section, and then right about here, starting on page 28, we get the solitaire rules. And there are two decks of cards, extensively one deck of card that helps you control uh, playing, executing the opponent's actions and things like that. And we'll take a look at that as we get into the cards themselves. But these are the rules for the solitaire expansion, uh, and these and it does mention in here as well for a couple of places that you could adopt this system for other versions of the game too. So, or at least to your own scenarios that you make with the battle generator in this game. So, lots of possibilities here for extending that, and these are rather extensive rules. They they kind of cover a lot of different situations. They seem to go on here for quite a while. Uh, now, I haven't read the Solitaire rules yet. I'm still going to kind of start out by playing two-player both ways for a while. I feel like that's usually the best way to get going. But yeah, the Solitaire rules here go quite a way, 
up into page 50 or so, and then we have some player aids that help execute those. So that's about, yeah, about 20 pages for the solid tier rules. And now we have what's included in this module. Now this was a separate expansion with uh, Storming the Gap, but the drive from, the Le uh, drive from Lena. Um, and this is the sequenced connection of scenarios. So this is kind of an operational level campaign that is brought on top of the core module. So in other words, you're going to be moving around units in kind of an operational sense and battalions and stuff like that, and regiments, and then they're going to kind of bump up on the campaign map and that's going to determine. So this is a much longer experience that covers a lot of linked scenarios that's very dynamic depending upon what happens in one scenario for the next one. And this is the system for executing that. And this again uh, is very similar to the drive uh, on drive on the Giessen, which was the expansion that did this in the uh, Storming the Gap series, but it's not, I think it's not quite as big as that one, and it's included in this. Now there's also uh, some information here on the Reinforcements Expansion, which seems to be more kind of a counters-based one. That is included in this as well, and it adds in here three uh, formations. So we get the UK 7th Armored Brigade, UK 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, and then the Soviet 109th, 197th Guards Tank Regiment. So this is a set of counters that expands gameplay, especially for making your own scenario. So this is kind of just documenting what's in that. I think that looks like it's mostly a counter set, and we'll take a look at that is in there. So then 76 pages done, and now we come to really the meat of this, which are all the scenarios that are included in the game here. So we get guns in a knife fight, and I think there are 20 altogether all extensively kind of set up. And then there are, of course, these, the solitaire modifications here that you're going to go. So sort of solo order of battle. So how to set it up and play it for solitaire and things like that. So everything's kind of integrated and the solo system is really built into this to allow for kind of expanded gameplay. Now, I won't go into too many details on the scenario because we've got a massive thing to look at here. But I believe when I looked, there were 20 scenarios. Let's kind of go through this. Oh, 15? There's more than that, I think. 16? Yeah, so 16 scenarios, and then I'm, I confess, I don't quite understand why campaign scenario one is here. I thought this was all kind of dynamically generated, but this is for that campaign Mac that drive on the, on the Lina, um, Lina. And, and I kind of, I'm not quite sure how that fits in there, but that looks like it's the first campaign, perhaps, the first scenario for that. And then from there, maybe everything is dynamic after that. But uh, that takes care of that. And then we get back into the appendix and some of the materials that we looked at before. So all together, 450 pages of documentation. <laughs> so again, there's a lot here. Uh, now I did pull out the counters separately. I wanna take a look at the counters next. So I'm gonna pull those in and let's take a look at those. There are uh, nine counter sheets. So we have seven counter sheets for the base game, a counter sheet of admin counters, and then a, the reinforcements counter sheet in here. And I've noticed sometimes with the lock and load publishing prototypes, the counters are extremely excited to get out and play. So these might fragment. I don't think this is usually the case with the final production versions, but I have seen this with some of the prototype things. So I wouldn't let that, uh, everything's here. It's just that things are kind of, they're getting ready to move around. We're looking at now, first up, are the West German units. And this module adds a lot of unique units. We're gonna see Commonwealth forces in here, new units, new types of armor, new aircraft and things like that, especially with the Commonwealth side. And then down here, we get the green US forces. Again, I really like the look of these and we'll take a quick look at one of these counters to kind of explain how the numbering works because it looks like there's a ton of information there, but once you understand what the system is, it's actually pretty easy to understand. It doesn't take much to kind of figure it all out. So there is our first counter sheet. Now I'll clean this up and then we'll take a look here at the, uh, the next one that comes up. All right, counter sheet two, we have US forces at the top. Not many US forces in this module. Again, an overwhelming kind of the, the newness here to this is the, the Commonwealth forces. And these are what we're looking at here. We've got Challenger tanks down here. Now, some of these again might've fallen out. So I put them back in different places. Uh, but yeah, we've got a bunch of, uh, of British units in here. Now, each one of these as well is printed on both sides. And there's a step system here. So we can see the reduced side over here. So we get to the third counter sheet. We finish off the Commonwealth forces. So we can see an entire full counter sheet here of Commonwealth forces. Then we get started to get into the Soviet forces. And let's just take a quick look at this T-64 tank to talk a little bit about how that works. So we can see we really have kind of five 
points, if you would, of numbers. The top left dictates the armor piercing firepower of it. So we have a range of 12. The middle number is the number of attack dice that you get to roll. And then the top number, the third number in that top left cluster is the to hit number for it. The top right three numbers are the same exact system. So range, dice, and then to hit, and that's for high explosive firepower. Your bottom left is your armor rating. It's your die roll and then the, the two, how many dice you get to roll and then your to hit number. The middle is the movement and then the bottom right is close combat. Now this little orange signal here indicates that the unit has reactive armor and that impacts how it performs as well. And some of the coloring here can change as well. But again, you've got what? six, eight, 10, 11 numbers on this essentially, which can look a little bit overwhelming, but once you understand what those numbers signify, it's pretty straightforward. You kind of figure out how they work right away. So pretty easy in that regard. Again, we start to drift into the Soviet units. We have leaders here. So lots of think headquarter units. So a lot of different elements in here. Now lots more Soviet forces. We've got helicopters in here. And again, this is a full-fledged World War III hypothetical system. So we've got air support, uh, helicopters, tanks, uh, transports, infantry, engineers, again, pontoons added in this module as well. So lots of stuff going on. And we could spend a lot of time probably doing an unboxing in and of itself just with the, the counters here. Now we start to get into some of the admins, one smoke, we got some bridges down here, Fords, reloading of missiles, no missiles out of ammo, low missile ammo. This is for kind of a tracking, uh, counters that are used for um, your chemical strikes and uh, off-board strikes and high explosive off-board strikes and things like that. So here are, are in the tunnel markers too. And there is a tunnel system in this one, which looks uh, rather interesting to kind of add in modern day combat. So we'll slide that off to the side. We get more admin counters here, burnt out, cleared. So again, these counters I think are interesting because they do signify a lot of the different types of mechanics that are gonna be in the game. You know, we can see here the helicopters uh, state here. So landed, we've got nap of the earth. Um, on the other side, we've got a couple of indi indica indicators for them. Improved positions, minefield, random minefield placed, rubble, electronic warfare, and all of these, you know, are, are their systems within themselves here. Now these did fall out, that's why they're a little bit crooked, but this is, you know, units that have taken actions, wrecks, disrupted, out of command, because there is a command and control module in here too. So we get through there, and then now, uh, we get to the admin sheet, and especially for some of these here, we see airstrike and blue control, red control. Uh, these are used for the campaign game, the map on the uh, the the uh, drive on drive from uh, Lina, and so this is uh, the ones that are going to be used on that campaign map, and we'll take a look at that as we look at the player aids too, because that's its own unique system there. So that's for that. And then this right here is our reinforcements set. So this adds those two British brigade, uh, two British units, and then the uh, Soviet uh, armored unit that's up in here. So more counters to add in and to expand your, your kind of generate your own scenarios as well. So altogether, nine counter sheets, and we're just getting started with the stuff in the box. Let me pull the box back in. I'm going to push these off so I don't uh, kind of have them fall all over the place, and we'll continue on in a moment. Right, so we've seen the 450 pages of documentation, the nine counter sheets. Now let's play with some cards. But before we do that, we have dice. And of course, there's not one or two dice. There are, what, four, seven, nine dice in here for the different sides of the system. Up oh, 10, 11, sorry, more. There's some escapees here. Looks like this kind of uh, popped out a little bit. So we get a bunch of six-sided dice. And again, the combat system, you're going to be rolling offensive dice to hit and defensive dice to negate hits. So you're going to be rolling quite a bit of dice. And that's one of the... the uh, the points on the system is that as the defending player, you're going to be, uh, you know, still actively involved in combat. You've got things to do to try to defend as you go through. So now we have uh, three different types of cards here. If we look at these, we get the unit cards here, and I'll put those over this side. And that's two piles of two, two kind of packages, if you would, of those. Then we get the solo assistant cards, and there are. There's one big deck, but they're kind of broken up into two. And then we get the unit cards. Um, the unit, well, not the unit cards, the formation cards. And so let's take a look at some of these in order. Let's start out with the uh, unit cards here. So the unit cards here are extraordinarily helpful. We get a bigger kind of overview of the thing. So if you do have challenges seeing any of the numbers, although I found these counters, they're three quarter inch counters, uh, really no difficulty seeing the numbers. There's really good contrast in them. So I haven't had any issues in kind of looking at those, but this does blow them up a little bit. So you get all the numbers on both sides of the counters here. Then you get all of kind of what type of unit is and any special rules that apply to this unit here. So I can see as you're playing, you know, one of the scenarios, you might have like five or 10 of these or so as the Soviet player, you can really kind of reference and 
and kind of get into the rules and kind of streamline play by having these available. Then I did wonder when I saw some of the cards before, um, why there were these kind of other number, these other distances here. And this is effective range, ranges for your miniature scale. So one hex equals 150 meters. So if you were to use this in a miniature system, you'd be using this. I'm not sure I, this will be something I would do, but if you are interested in that, that would be handy. And again, these are single-sided, so you're going to be keeping these face up. Uh, to be able to kind of figure out what works, but a lot of stuff. There's also a great way of kind of getting a sense for what's in the game. And we're looking through uh, the Soviet ones here, lots of different weapons. And there's one for every single type of unit that's in the game. And as we can see here, there are a lot of them. So a huge variety of units. I mean, again, getting at that idea that it's quickly becoming more than a game. It's becoming a system for this kind of 1985 hypothetical World War III, uh, you know, European combat system. But tons of these in here. Then we get to the, again, the addition to this module in, in Blood and Fury is the British ones. Here we have the Challenger, Chieftain, F101, FV-101 Scorpion, Recon, FV-102 Striker. And there's also ones for like the, the pontoon units that are in here. We're going to see some for aircraft. So there is, here's the Harrier CAS headquarters unit. So again, and with all the rules written off to the side to kind of help you uh, break right from what that counter is. If you've got a question on how it functions, it slides right into the appropriate rule that you can look up. And I do think that here, as we'll see with the player aids, there's been extraordinary efforts made to help make you know the complexities of 1985 warfare be manageable and easy to play. So even though there's a lot of rules, the rules clarity and the way all the information is integrated, I think really makes it a system that normally would probably be something like an eight or perhaps a nine complexity. But I think the organizational uh, kind of efficiency of this set, the unit cards, the way the rules are integrated and the clarity of the rules really brings that down to a much more manageable uh, type of experience. And there are beginner scenarios in that scenario rule book too. So you're gonna start off with some simpler ones. Here we go, infantry parachutes, javelins, land rovers, leaders. So again, more British units here. Here's a pontoon unit right here that we can see. So those are there. And we get the new, uh, we get all the American units. And again, Americans are playing a rather minor role in this module as compared to uh, Storming the Gap. We do get Bradleys. We get Abrams, of course, as we would expect. And then here we have the uh, West German units. Leopards everything in here. So tons of these unit cards in here. There is a massive stack of these. So again, no skimping on what's inside the box. Let's take a look now at the uh, solo assistant cards. So we've got a lot of stuff in here. So this is the solo module. And again, there are, what is there, 96 cards in this. And the way this works is that the first ones in here, there's kind of some, I mean, I've kind of played around, just kind of skimmed through the rules for this. There are some core cards here, which are kind of your one through 35, 36. Then there's these cards that help reload the orders. But we can see, you know, got assault, fire, execute counteractions, uh, battlefield situation, and kind of all these things. And it, this, I, I don't quite get this yet because I really haven't spent that much time digging into this solo mode, but it's going to depend on like the, the posture of the enemy as to what their decision-making tree is going to be. So really feels like this is a system that's pretty well thought out. And again, the rules do say that there are times as the human player, you might want to override what the system is telling you, but it seems like it's going to get you a lot of the way towards uh, kind of building up your own solo system and solo experiences with this game. So I'm very much looking forward to trying this off, uh, trying this out. Then we get a reload. This reloads parts of the deck. Then we get action events here, which kind of creates some unique events and some unique decision-making things for, for what happens in the battle. Uh, battlefield events that kind of add more kind of uniqueness and complexity. And then these, I'm not sure quite yet what these back-end ones are. These are AEO orders. Maybe they're for specific scenarios or unique scenarios or something like that, um, or ways to add in different complexities depending upon what's happening in the scenario. But again, a 96-card system for uh, solo combat added to this. So this is, there's definitely and clearly in the way these are integrated into the scenarios, there's definitely an emphasis on the solo player for this module in particular. So, you know, again, with the updated rule set, with the solo module in 
here, with the campaign in here, if you're looking to get into the system and have heard good things about it, this might be a really nice place to start, especially if you are a solo player. Now, we get the formation cards, and again, this is probably a good time to talk a little bit about how these work. These are some objective cards, battlefield events, and you, you're going to basically, at the beginning of each uh, round, you're going to put in formation cards for the units that are there. And if I'm not mistaken, the NATO units get two formation cards per uh, formation, and so they're going to be, you might be outnumbered as the NATO forces, but they're going to perform at a higher efficiency. So that's why we have double of these cards. So you, these could potentially act twice in a turn, and there are ways for the turn to end before these act, so there is some kind of variety added in here too. But that's the way the NATO efficiency is modeled in the game, so you might be outnumbered by a good bit, but you're going to get the chance to be more active. Then, of course, these numbers here are top number is morale. I think this is command radius, and this is command radius uh, on the bottom right, command radius when the unit has been uh, disrupted. So again, these are for every unit in the game, you've got these different elements here that you're going to be pulling in. So you're going to take these decks, create a deck depending upon which formations and units are in the game, and then you're going to be pulling through those. And that's going to trigger which unit acts, uh, which formation acts for that particular part of the turn. So creating kind of an unpredictability and some chaos to the, the modern battle battlefield. Here we can see, uh, so here's one for the, the combat air support for Harriers, and then we get into the Soviet ones. These, of course, brown or British here, then the Soviet cards here, and they look very similar, so we won't go through them, them all, but you get an idea. There are a, a ton of them here. That's the second of the third uh, deck that's in here. Here we get some US ones, and then more British United Kingdom ones here for the, the rest of these, and again, there's a, there's a lot of them here. So if we were to pull these out and put them side by side, I, I could probably count through them. 5, 21, 26. I think that the numbering system might more be by nation there too, but yeah, you get a good bit of cards. <laughs> so there are a lot of cards in this system. Okay, so let me put those away, then we'll come back and take a look at the player aids. All right, player aids and maps, but uh, as we have come to, let me pull this off to the side here. We do get a veritable library of player aids. So I'm gonna go through these relatively uh, quickly, but I do wanna show them to you. This, uh, again, kind of figuring out how this all works with uh, the units and things like that. This explains all of the different numbers and systems on the units here. So this is your player aid one, which was unit and card reference. This again explains the formation card, talks about a lot of the subtleties. Here we have the different uniqueness based on these colored triangles. So if there's anything on a counter that you've forgotten or need to look up, this is going to help clarify that. On the back side of this, we get the, the explanations for all the different markers that are in the game, the counter references there. So that is our first one here. The uh, a detailed and articulate uh, sequence of play. And I would say this looks more complicated because it's kind of explaining what's going on here. The sequence of play really is this side here. This kind of gives you some instructions on what to execute. The sequence of play isn't nearly as intimidating as this would look, because um, many of these things are just really quick checks, and there's only, it's, it's basically kind of, you've got a preparations phase, you've got some closer combat, you've got a few different kind of actions that happen. And the most, the biggest part of this here is going to be your formation impulse steps, where you're going to be drawing cards and acting on um, for different formations. And that's really the bulk of the game, and it's it looks more complicated, I think, than the, the actual execution, execution is. Here are your role, all of the direct fire modifiers in the game, which could be handy to have. Now, we get uh, the next set here are uh, player aid threes, which are your train effects. This is a rather extensive one here, and in particular, I mentioned this in other uh, first looks at this series. I really like how you've got the unit height here and the obstacle height for uh, kind of the, the line of sight system in these types of platoon games when you've got long ranges of like 13 and stuff like that, or, or 10 or 8. It can get kind of... Uh, esoteric, I think, and this really helps that because with the line of sight, even the player aid we'll see, and the clarity of the rules and the examples that's in there, and this information that you can always look up, for example, what is the height of a helicopter hovering over cultivated land? One, okay, and you just know that, and it's just right here. So any of that calculation, you can look on this terrain effects chart and be able to really kind of determine line of sight uh, much more quickly than if you have to do that math in your head for a number of units and things. Fire modifiers, everything here, and again, these are two-sided depending upon the types of terrain that are in the 
game. And then we have a second one here. Then there is uh, Battlefield Events and Battlefield Friction. These cards can get drawn that can add kind of almost like unique events to a different scenario. So you're going to do a die roll for this. It's going to determine what happens when that card comes up. So this can create some kind of some randomness and some variety in a scenario that could impact the scenario in somewhat of a way. And I believe the Friction ones are generated off of this. So yeah, so if you roll a seven, you get no battlefield event. Instead, that's how you get to this backside, so the even rarer friction side. So different types of things that can happen. So again, a way to kind of bring in a story element and some unique elements to gameplay here. We get to player aid number five. This is uh, kind of, if we look at these missile ammo usage charts, special ability triangle reference. This gets at the references for those triangles and what those mean. Again, helping you with different information. Weather changes, so these are kind of miscellaneous charts. Movement and fire, summer chart, onboard indirect fire, and that one ends there. So lots of different elements for kind of the miscellaneous player aids. These next three are your tracks. So there's going to be turn record track, kind of your off-board artillery strikes, the formation deck being kind of going through and using that. And then this is your one that collects the dead units and the ready to be deployed and suppressed headquarters casualties down the bottom. So these are gonna sit off to the side in scenarios where you're gonna be kind of keeping track of, of off-board uh, information that's not actually there. This number, uh, this seven, I believe it is, or 8A is the, the extensive line of sight. Help me. So this can be very handy as you're kind of learning the system and trying to figure out line of sight. And the backside of this, again, gives kind of the specific rules for this. So very handy for figuring out line of sight. I read through the line of sight rules. This is often where I get stuck on this. I found the system to be very clear. I mean, you kind of got to play with it to get a sense for, for how it's going to work. But I'm in cards that it's not going to be... Um, these can get really fiddly, I think, in, in kind of the, this level of platoon level combat and modern combat. But this looks really encouraging. Every die roll in the series, player aid. Again, I really do think there's somebody that at, at Lock and Load Publishing that when they come with them in a new game, their sole job is to think of new player aids and then they get a chance to make them and nobody tells them no. <laughs> so let's make a player aid for every die roll in the series. Oh, that's a great idea. Here you go. Which I imagine could be really helpful if you're trying to figure out how to execute a die roll for minefield depletion. It's right here. So you can keep this handy and look these up. But I have never seen a player aid like that in a game and it's here. Then uh, we get card inventory. So you've got just basically a list of all the different cards, formation cards that are in the game in terms of how to get those into play. We are almost done with the player aids, but not quite yet. This is the battle generator assistant. So how you can figure out and use these for uh, generating your own battles. And again, this gets in that idea of the, this being a system more than a game, because now here we're looking at something that's going to allow you to take those you know, nine counter sheets and really generate and the maps and stuff like that, especially if you've got maps from the other modules and expansions to really kind of be creative and to generate whatever you'd like to generate. You know, you're not limited by any means to the, the 16 scenarios that are in the, the, the game here, plus the drive on the line system campaign game. I mean, there is a ton of gameplay here. It's just, there is so much stuff in just this module let alone the fact that, okay, now you can kind of generate your own scenarios. And it, it's a really elegant system. I think it's going to work really, really well. Our last player aid are the solo assistants. So these are different uh, formations, information, things you're going to need to know to be able to execute the solo assistant. So again, everything, you get that the massive pile of documentation, but all of the information that you're going to need to execute the game has been distilled in kind of this intermediary, if you would, uh, you know, av um, assistant to play where it's all packed into these player aids and then you can be using that again, instead of diving into the rule book and things. Now I may have said that we were done with player aids, so you might be wondering what are these next four things, but this is the drive on the line, the campaign maps, and the execution is kind of an operational player aid for this. So this basically gives you the, the map layout. Each one of these represents map zones. And I think these numbers are the maps from other modules. So that ones that aren't necessarily included in this, but you don't have to use those. You can use the four ones that the four maps that are included in this package to execute it because no scenario requires more than four maps. So I think these are optional placements. You could play this campaign completely without these specific maps in here. So uh, we've got, this is the map. And again, this is how they're all linked together. So you're going to be starting in a certain place and not having really dug into it. You know, forces are going to be advancing. These are kind of the highways connecting it and the options in different places you're going to be moving your units. And then after both players plot their movement, the movement is executed. You see where there are opposing forces in the same area. 
that's where you generate the scenario and fight it out. So this one again is shorter than the drive on the Geeson. This is a smaller campaign, but it still looks like an, a ton of fun. I mean, hours of gameplay being able to have these link scenarios together uh, to be able to execute this. And so this is the red for the Soviets. We have a blue one for the uh, US NATO forces. Uh, Commonwealth and West German forces. And then these are the player aids because that plotting is going to be done secretly. You need kind of a player aid to hide it. So you'd be holding these up. And this has your, the markers, the counter reference for that campaign map. We looked at that counter sheet there. Uh, other information on some of the tables of play for this. And then a sequence of play that would be in front of you. And the sequence of play for the campaign game seems rather straightforward. So I don't think it's going to add a lot of complexity to the game. But uh, if you had someone where you could get together for this game on a regular basis, I could see this this being just a ton of fun to be able to play through a massive campaign game with lots of linked scenarios. Almost, but not quite done, we still have the four slash eight game maps that are included here. So we have numbers four, five, six, and seven. And let's take a look at these as we go through these. So I'll open these up and they might actually fit on screen well, but I'll show a, a, a zoomed out version of these too. That might be a little bit easier to see. So here is map four. Now each one of these hexes is an inch across. And again, the counters are three quarters of an inch. Stacking is two units per hex. So again, we're not going to be looking at a massive pile of units moving around. I think it's going to be a very manageable system in terms of uh, kind of executing gameplay. So this one, a very kind of uh, rural setting. We've got rivers. We've got a small town here. We've got altitude hills in here, woods blocking it off here. And then on this other side, we get the snowy version of the same map. So this is the same exact map. I think we were holding it this way. So we get the same map that was in the northwest corner up here. Rivers and roads are all the same. This would just allow you to play that scenario at a different time of the year. So let's take a look at that one. I will kind of show these since there's only four. Let's take a look at map five. I'll kind of go through these quickly so you can see them. Um, I love the color palette and I think there's been a lot of thought put into these to kind of have the impact gameplay. So this one, we've got a bunch of smaller towns, but a very similar setting, you know, rural kind of German uh, territory here in terms of woods, hills, open spaces, some small towns and things like that. So I think especially with armor involved, it'll kind of create a very flowing engagement. So not a lot of, um, some of the other maps from the earlier modules had, uh, you know, some different, uh, lots of different terrain, of course, in the system, which is good, right? You want different varieties, but, you know, some of the urban ones and some of the packed towns would create a whole different type of battlefield experience. But this looks more open, you know, going to be dealing with altitude and hills, blocking line of sights, small towns and things like that, a flowing, definitely type of a flowing type of combat engagement, very typical of uh, rural German landscape in 1985. And then our very last one, and these, by the way, these are roughly 13 inches by 19, and they are all geomorphic. So they're gonna match up on the edges. You can put these together in a variety of formations and formats, and they are all compatible, same size, same hex size, same types as with the earlier modules. So if you have the earlier modules, you're looking again, leaning into that thing. I've mentioned it a bunch, but you're learning into that idea that this is much more than just a game. Now you're getting a game system. So again, another map, highway right down the middle, small town, hills on both sides. I could see this being really interesting. You get units up in the hills, kind of overlooking the town, forces trying to push through and you're trying to stop them. I mean, just lots of kind of creative maps and look like that's gonna be in here to, to mess around with and play. And there we go. This may set the record. I know when I was taking photos of this to kind of get ready to lay into the video, I set a record. It was 71 images to capture all the stuff. This might be one of the most packed boxes in wargaming that I've done a first look video on in the two years that I've been doing these. So I hope you find it helpful. I would love to answer any questions to the degree that I can. This will be the next playthrough project on the channel. So I'm going to be bringing action from one of these scenarios from the, the game to the channel in a relatively soon uh, short order as we go forward so uh, I look forward to your questions and comments and and as we get into that I hope you'll enjoy that as well I'll put a link to that uh, up here as soon as it's ready thanks so much for watching everybody have a great day